Kirk, I did not mention it in the first hour, but um, there was a um, uh, there was a terrible hostage situation uh, taking place in Mali, and um, I think there's 120 people that are being held hostage. The uh, reports are that the uh, the gunman um, came in uh, screaming, um, "Guess what phrase?" Yeah. As my God is greater than your God, uh, saying that the God of Islam is greater than the uh, the God of the Yehudim. The God of the Yehudim is Yahweh. He happens to be the one and only God, the only spirit that wants to be considered greater than Allah U Akbar, than uh, Yahweh, is Hasatan, Satan. Uh, and uh, his favorite guys, by far, his, uh, his most natural state is as Allah. And... Uh, what they did is once they went in and got the, uh, the uh, captives, they let uh, 20 of them go. You know why they let 20 of the, uh, what was originally 140 captives go? Uh, probably to let, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it's a motive to, uh, no, I'm not No, sure. because they could cite verses from the Oh, oh yeah, memory. they ask them, they ask them to cite the verses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, the U.S. Congress is now engaged in a uh, in evaluating legislation that would uh, vet the uh, refugees from places like Syria that want to resettle in or settle in the United States. And they said there's going to be a vetting test, but it will not be a religious test. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did get that. <laughs> Uh, can, I, can I ask my last little question on um, yes. on the uh, commercial? Uh, which informs which, which one would, would inform one about the eternity best, the last hour of Chattering Mess or the military with bail stick? Yeah, well, <laughs> military with Babel, which is with uh, bail uh, stick. Uh, you know what I thought was appropriate with that? And that's the last time I'll ever have to hear that ad. Yeah, and that may be the ad that had the single biggest influence of me saying, I can't be part of this anymore. Um, the, the, uh, the interesting thing is, you know what music was playing uh, in the background as they uh, introduced their military Bible stick, which is an oral presentation of the uh, Christian New Testament, which means the poison pen and the plagued deadly doctrine of Paul. Um, you know what music was playing? Well, it sounded familiar. It wasn't... Uh, oh, yeah, it was really familiar. It was Taps. Yeah, the theme song, wasn't it? It was Taps. It was Taps. Uh, taps, yeah. Taps is the, uh, is, the, is the bugle sound played at funerals of, uh, of military uh, uh, combatants. Taps. So... <laughs> So, so as a, a fitting, a fitting and appropriate, we're going to play the song of uh, of death for the uh, for the military Bible stick. Isn't it just? That's, that's a great point. Isn't it just perfect? Great, great. Yep. So when you uh, when you understand that the Torah is light, that means the Torah is eternal. Um, that means that the Torah is enlightening. That means that the Torah's means of saving is enlightening us so that we appear and are, in fact, purpose, because in the presence of light, there is no darkness. And so everything you need to know about the Torah, about the set-apart spirit, about Yosha, about Yahweh, about the covenant and what we inherit, all of it is explained when you realize that Yahweh equals light, the Torah equals light. The set-apart spirit equals light. Yosha equals light. Yosha's coming back as light. Folks, that is what we, that is in fact what we are inheriting when we become part of the Torah. You know, Yahweh said he made us in his image, and, uh, and he has stated that as part of us becoming part of the covenant family, we will become more like him. Mm-hmm. We will be transformed entirely into light. The part of us that is like him now is our soul, our character, our persona, our ability to, ex to, to be observant and to respond to what we, uh, what we see, what we experience, and uh, to be thoughtful and to exercise free will and to choose to, to love, to explore, to learn, to grow. That's what makes us like him. But we're going to be 
absolutely like him when he transforms us into light. And the means of that transformation is found in a singular place, the reservoir of Yahweh's light in our world, his Torah teaching. And that means, my friends, that the rubbish found in that military Bible stick is certain to condemn your soul. Because Pauline doctrine and the religion of Christianity is based almost entirety on, entirely on the notion that the Torah is of the flesh, which is not. It is a spiritual document because it is light. So Paul's primary argument, which was a Gnostic argument, against it is untrue. The Torah is not of the flesh. Paul's argument in Romans was that it was dead, represented by the dead husband in Romans 7. So you light. Can, how do you kill light? You can't kill light. No. So it is it is eternal. It is uh, um, the, the opposite of the flesh. It is energy-based and therefore light. And when you see those things, you come to the realization that... Um, that everything Paul wrote and everything Christians believe is untrue. Matter of fact, how do you kill God? How can God die for your sins when God is light? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you can't even kill Satan. You have to put him away. Right. That's why Sheol, which is the place of where Satan will spend eternity, which is also happens to be the founder of Christianity's given name, that, that it is a lightless prison. It's a place where light cannot escape. Light isn't destroyed in it. It's just that light cannot escape. Go away. And go away. And it is a place, since light cannot escape, of total darkness. That's why it's yeah. called a black hole. And where there is total darkness, there is no Yahweh, because Yahweh is light. Did they... Yeah, the profound truths that you can derive based on this concept is, is amazing. I want to end our program by, uh, by sharing a, a series of statements uh, come from the, the most uh, profound of the, uh, the prophets, a prophet whose scope goes all the way from around 700 BCE to uh, uh, all the way talking about things that will transpire in uh, 2033. Uh, CE. So, you know, it's, we're talking about a 2,700-year uh, expanse of time mm -hmm. by this prophet. His name is Yahshua. Uh, it means salvation is from Yahweh. Uh, we're going to cover as much as this hour allows. Yahshua, 53, sent to me by uh, a, um, a good friend, a friend of, of ours who contributed to our program yesterday. Larry sent this uh, to me. It's, it's actually from uh, one of the, uh, the chapters in Yadda Yadda. It says, we hid our faces from him. We despised him in our thinking and in our schemes. We did not value him. Who didn't we value? Yosha. Yeah. And who is Yosha? The diminished manifestation of Yahweh. So who did we... Um, we walked away from Yahweh. That is correct. We hid our faces. Remember in the garden when uh, Adam uh, and Shawa yeah. hid their faces from uh, Yahweh? Absolutely. Yeah. Day one. Yeah. The first, that's the first time. And that is correct. So they're trying, because you want to hide from the light. If you know you're wrong, yeah. you want to hide from the light. We despised him. And Christians despise Yahweh. They despise him. They despise his Torah. They literally despise him. You, know, you, you talk to a Christian about the Torah, they get angry. That doesn't apply to us. You talk to them about the seven Moed Mikra, the meetings that Yahweh has invited us to, and they get angry. Say, that doesn't apply to us. That's the Jews, and we don't. We, and they down deep don't like the Jews either. Yeah, you tell them don't, I don't participate in Christmas, and they just right. freak out. Yeah, and this what says that there's Chasab, that we... Um, um, despised him in our thinking and in our schemes, in our planning, in our inventing, in our imaginations, when we conceived religious and political schemes. We did not value him. You know, that's the, uh, the basis of um, the, uh, the 
statement that Yah etched in stone, it would be uh, the, uh, the fifth statement in stone. We should value our Heavenly Father and spiritual Father. We did not value. We plotted and contrived thinking up schemes to see him assaulted and struck down by God in the face. And indeed, uh, Yosha's physical body was struck down by God, and his soul was. That's why he said in the prophecy in, in uh, Samuel uh, 7, 2 Samuel 7, that uh, when sin is associated with him, that he would not spare the punishment. Yeah, yeah. The punishment fell upon him for our renewal, and by his scourging blows, we are cured, healed, and repaired. That's the reason he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm talking to you, but you don't respond. Because the moment that our rebellion was put on him, and that's the moment that the set-apart spirit left him, he was a man condemned. He was a man who was now in rebellion against God. All of our guilt, our sin, our perversion was placed upon him. And it says that, that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Man has turned to his own way. Wow. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Man has turned to his own way. You know, the fact of the matter is that uh, in Yashayam, for a for better part of uh, 2,700 years, Yahweh laments, I was looking for someone. I wanted to find someone with whom I could share, whom I could relate, whom I could communicate through. Couldn't find anyone. That. Thank you. Couldn't find anyone. For vast chasms of time. And so uh, God is saying that we all like sheep have gone astray. And man has turned to his own way. Christianity. Islam. Hinduism. Buddhism. Judaism. Socialist, secular, whatever. humanism, communism, socialism, humanism. Why do we need this? Why yeah, we, particularly why with, so with God in the, in the midst of the most profound of the prophets saying that man has turned to his own way. This is why we've devoted the first hour of this program to exposing the realization that every human institution is man's way. There isn't a single human institution that is representative of God's way. Everyone has turned away from God. This says, but Yahweh has caused the guilt and the punishment, the awon, the perverse corruptions, the depravity, the consequence of sin. And a one is really means corruptions and perversions, which is how religion and politics prevail. They don't invent a new reality. They corrupt and pervert reality. That he has caused the perversion and corruptions of us all to fall on him. And him, this is Yahweh speaking, to fall on him. They befell this diminished manifestation of Yahweh. He was driven and harassed, oppressed, victimized, and he was afflicted and humbled, and all. yet he did not open his mouth. This is the beauty of the, uh, of the four of the invitations, Kirk, that expressly use ana as a verb. And the primary meaning of ana is to answer an invitation and to, um, to uh, do so uh, vocally, do so physically, but it is to answer and respond to an invitation. And, uh, but there is a dark side of Anah. Down about the 12th definition of Anah, you'll find afflict. And it's like most of the terms that Yahweh uses. He afflicted himself, so we would be able to answer the invitation. Yeah, which changes um, the Yom Kippurim. Correct. Profoundly. Rather than us afflicting our soul, which is impossible for us to do and would be counterproductive, particularly on a day of reconciliations, mm -hmm. We answer and respond to the invitation because Yahweh afflicted his soul. It's profound when what happens when your perspective is right, when your understanding is right, how profound this plan is 
the plan that Yahweh conceived to be able to exonerate us is being articulated here. So it says, uh, he does not open his, uh, his mouth like a lamb that is led and uh, to and bears the slaughter before it shears. So he does not complain. Well, if he's a lamb being led to the, the slaughter, then he is the sacrificial lamb. And there's only one place that the sacrificial lamb plays a starring role. That would be Passover. Yeah, Pesach. Pesach. The fact that he, he fulfilled Pesach, and this is where he endured the blows. This is where his body was slaughtered as the Passover lamb for our benefit. And this occurred on Passover, and he's referred to as the lamb here. You do not have to be the sharpest implement in the drawer to make this connection. He is the Passover lamb. Yes. And as the Passover lamb, if you do not celebrate what happened as Passover, you obviously you, don't care. Then you are missing the entire point. And what he did on that upright pole on Mount Moriah on Passover has no value whatsoever to you. If you're not celebrating it as Passover, if you're celebrating it as Easter or Good Friday leading to Easter, you have lost the no entirety of the purpose. You, rather than benefiting from it, all you're doing is alienating yourself from God, angering him. He was fetched from a barren, enclosed prison. The exercise of good judgment and a just resolution, who in this generation meditated and complained against him. I've been, by the way, in that um, dark enclosed prison that he was put in um, prior to being led to become the Passover lamb. I've actually been in it. It is uh, an extraordinarily uh, extraordinary experience being in it. But what he is, is, uh, is saying is that we tried to imprison God, and then um, he is foreshadowing the fact that his soul is going to be, was going to be imprisoned in Sheol, in a light real place. Yeah from a barren and closed prison. For indeed, he was cut off and separated. This is what this means. You know, first thing, what did he say? My God, my God, why have you separated yourself from me? Well, 700 years before this happened, he said, for indeed, he was cut off and separated away from the land of the living because of the revolt of my family to whom the stroke was due. So his physical body was cut off and separated. That's when he said, when the set-apart spirit left him. His was separated from God, and then his soul went to the place of separation. And he left the land of the living to Sheol. This is what happened on Matzah. This is the thing that is explained here, but you would never know if you were um, totally dependent upon the uh, eyewitness accounts in the Christian New Testament, you would never know. That's true. His place of dying and death by violent means was assigned to be with the condemned and was with a rich man. So what they're saying here is that after his body was killed, and it's only his physical body, mm -hmm. that uh, he, uh, he went to a, um, a place that... Uh, well, where a, so he was both with the condemned as he hung on the upright pole, and then he was placed in a tomb of a rich man. And indeed, the tomb that uh, is uh, on Mount Moriah, uh, directly above the, uh, the place where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the, and the upright pole was placed for him to be the Pesach lamb, that it was a tomb of a rich man, and indeed... And it was a history, that's historic, yeah. Yeah, that is what, uh, what occurred. And it's, of course, on Mount Moriah. He will appear and see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the will of Yahweh will be advanced, coming forth mightily in his hand. 
This is uh, Yashenga 5310. So when the physical body died, and then the soul was put into the lightless enclosure, uh, then at that time, we, we are told, and Yosha knew, that he would be released from the darkness of the realm of death, and that he would appear, and that he would see his offspring. Who are his offspring? Yeah, the children of the covenant. Absolutely. That he will see his offspring. His days will be prolonged, a rock maintained. And he will, and the will of Yahweh, the, the purpose of Yahweh, the desire of Yahweh will be advanced, coming forth mightily in his hand. This tells you that Yosha was the hand of Yahweh, mm -hmm. performing the will of Yahweh, which is to advance Yahweh's desire. What does Yahweh desire most of all? The family. The family. The family. <laughs> yep, exactly. And this is how he was advancing it. Out of the toil of his soul, he will see the light and find satisfaction. So did it say here, out of the toll of his body? Did it say out of the toll of his death? It said out of the toll of his soul, didn't it? Mm -hmm. That should be a profound insight. So we have the sacrificial lamb going to the slaughter. That's Pesach. And now we have the soul. The toil of the soul. Now, since the, the sacrificial lamb has been uh, slaughtered, slain for our benefit on Pesach, what in the world was the soil, the, what was the toil of the soul? It says the work, the great effort, the amal, it's the, the suffering uh, uh, and the misery and the distressing experience of his soul. What was that? Well, that's the sin being scraped off, or the sin being separated. Yeah. From the soul. That's, and that's him being in shield. In shield. Him, him paying the price that we should have paid. He bore our uh, sentence. The judgment that should have been placed on us was placed on him. He actually paid the price by having to endure what would have seemed like an eternity in a spiritual realm in shield on our behalf. And it was his soul did it. Now, if a soul is dead, a body dies, your God died, your, the soul is dead, right? That's the sign that you're dead when your soul flees. But his soul was still working. Yeah, this is amazing, this, this statement, if you to think about it and what it represents. Out of the toil of his soul, he will see the light and find satisfaction. will find, actually, fulfillment. Shabbat is to fulfill, to complete. And so he'll be completed. He will find fulfillment. So his soul was toiling, which means he could not be dead. No. Because it is when the soul departs the body, uh, and you no longer have any breath, soul and breath are the same thing. Consciousness is gone that the person is dead. But his soul wasn't obviously dead. His soul on the Shabbat of Matzah was toiling. Right. It's even more tragic than just he, he, he has to be associated with uh, the spirits of sin. Right. Yeah, as well. that's, but, it's, but it's explaining what was happening here on Matzah. His right. soil, soul was still toiling. Was and he was not dead. No. The body was dead. Not the soul. And of course we, we know that on the Passover lamb, the part that is not consumed is destroyed that night. Mm -hmm. Extending his hands and, and arms and spreading himself out for our sake and relationship. He uh, barred and left destitute his soul unto death. So his soul went to the place of the realm of the dead. Indeed, from the brilliant service arrival until the entrance at sunset, my name will be great. In and among the Gentiles and in every home, which gathers together and approaches near, the purifying offering which encloses and joins to my name, a purifying and cleansing gift. Indeed, my name is exceedingly powerful and great. And in among the Gentiles, says Yahweh, of the core of spiritual assistance. Well, this tells you when he's going to come back. It's going to be at sunset. He's coming back on Yom Kippurim. So that's 6.22 p.m. Uh, Jerusalem time.
um, on uh, the Day of Reconciliations, which is uh, will begin at sunset on uh, October 2nd, 2033, in our pagan calendars. Right down to the moment you can track his return. And he's coming back as light. He's told us right here. The entrance will be at sunset, as shining in the east. What's, um, Mount of Olives is where he's coming back. It's east of the uh, of Mount Moriah. And he's, he's not coming back in uh, as the name Yosha because he says, my name will be great. Right. Yeah, well. My name will be great. My name will be purified. My name will join you to me. Well. My name is exceedingly powerful. And yet today there isn't um, a Jew or a Gentile, not one in a million, that has joined themselves to his name. This is interesting. We're going to switch now to uh, Malachi. But you pierce him and defile him with your boastful declarations. The table of my upright one, his fruit is despised food. Oh, wow, yeah, we consume everything as poison. So then this condition, by the way, this despised food, what that means also is that the Torah is nourishing food, and this despised food is the Torah. So then this condition is to you, O oh clerics, if you do not listen, and if you do not place it on your heart to give glory to my name, says Yahweh, of the spiritual envoys, I will send out in and among you a curse. I will curse with your kneeling down. Mm. <laughs> and will also bring a curse on her, speaking of Israel, because you did not place it on your heart. What do you need to place in your heart? Well, Yahweh says that the Torah is was given in Israel. It's the Torah. You didn't place it on your heart to hold. As a result of my rebuke, all of your seed will be scattered with worthless animal remains upon your faces. Your festival feasts are dung. The holidays what is slam against Christmas? of man. Easter. God. Mm -hmm. Fourth of July. Halloween. Well, every one of them. Your festivals and feasts, your gatherings and celebrations are dung. A collection of, of butchered animal carcasses and fecal matter. So you want to know what the, you know, the Christians say, you know, I know it's pagan, but that's not what it means to me. Well, now you know what it means to you. Yeah. He says your festival, your Christmas, your Easter, your Halloween, your Fourth of July, it's dung. Your Veterans Day, your Memorial Day, it's dung, it's crap. You will all know that indeed... I sent you with the terms and conditions of the relationship agreement. And with this condition, with my family-oriented covenant relationship in association with the Loi, says Yahweh, mm -hmm. of the assembled spiritual conscripts. My familial covenant relationship, my bereath, exists with you and with him. Life and salvation, shalom, reconciliation. Friendship, peace in the relationship. I gave them to him reverently and respectfully. He reveres and respects me on account of the presence of my name. And on because of the presence of my name, he is awesome and astonishing. Guess what Jesus doesn't have? Yahweh's name. Yosha does. Yes. In healing reconciliation and in uprightness, he walks with me. And many he reconciles, returns, and restores. Shub. From sin. The trustworthy and reliable Torah will exist in his mouth. Wickedness will not be found on his lips. In healing, reconciliation, and in uprightness, he walks with me, and he reconciles and returns, restores from sin. 
What is the uh, Torah? It's called trustworthy and reliable. Mm -hmm. What exists in his mouth? The Torah. Mm -hmm. So if the Torah existed in his mouth, and indeed it did, because his first public address was all about the Torah, mm -hmm. then there is a 0% possibility that Pauline Christianity is anything other than a complete rebuke of everything Yahweh represents, everything that he has ever said, everything that he has ever offered. It not only isn't a path to God, it is a path to God hating you. Boy, it's so a bad. path, yeah, it's a path to God viewing you as dung. Boy. Boy. All of those people who will gather in a month's time to celebrate Christmas, viewed as dung, they will be singing all of their little religious songs, all thinking that they're doing this wondrous thing and God will view them as dung. A friend of mine, a friend of ours, uh, James, sent me an email from a uh, fellow that um, um, reviewed a movie called Saving Christmas. And uh, in the... Uh, in the movie, um, the uh, the character finds somebody that's, I guess, ball humbug and uh, and uh, I was the other so, day. yeah. So this um, this individual talks about all the redeeming factors of Christmas, how the tree represents the cross, and uh, how uh, you know it's 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 a time of of renewal and of and he just goes on and on and on to try to justify this purely pagan. Best of all, that God is just called dung. Yeah. Yeah. And the tree itself, God says, are you crazy? That lifeless thing that you cut from the forest, the totters that you you put on Earth. silver and gold, and you actually venerate it? And why would you do such a stupid thing? Yeah. yeah. And so here is a Christian theologian explaining how all of those things are righteous. And so, yeah, they're all dung. It is twisting words. I mean, of these. Uh, yeah. It says, "For as for yourselves, you have turned away from the way, causing many to stumble. By your instructions and teachings, you corrupt and invalidate the family covenant relationship." Says Yahweh. And more than any people in the history of mankind, his chosen people, Israel did this, a Benjamite in particular. Yes. First and foremost, a Benjamite. Shaul, who became the Christian one of the apostles, Paul. You yourselves have turned away from the way, causing many to stumble by your instructions and your teaching. And you corrupt and invalidate the familial covenant relationship, says Yahweh. This is, uh, it says your Torah here. Your Torah. Well, the Jews have their Torah. It's called the, uh, the Talmud. It's the oral law. They have their Torah. And uh, he's saying, you know, you turned many away, causing many to stumble by your Torah. But there is a, um, a Torah of Paul. And that Torah of Paul is his teaching, mm -hmm. his instructions. And it's his teaching and his instructions, Paul's Torah, his new covenant, mm -hmm. that have caused so many to be turned away, so many to be corrupted and invalidated, perverted and destroyed, annihilated. The consequence of the Christian teaching. Uh, God's as explicit here as he could possibly be. Whether it's Rabbi Akiva or Pauline Christianity with Judaism or Christianity, these are all doctrines that have turned people away. So then I will give you over to be despised and to be afflicted on behalf of all people. Consequence, my friend. There has to be a consequence. If you're a victim, he says that uh, you're going to be uh, um, to die. Yeah, going to die. Life, shorten your life. But for those that have turned away from the way, causing many to stumble, 
for those who have kind of come up with their own instructions and teachings that corrupt and invalidate. So then I will give you over to be despised and to be afflicted. What's Paul called in heaven? He says, lowly and little. Despised. Yeah, despised. Absolutely. To be despised and to be afflicted. They're going to go to the place that Yosha's soul was afflicted. I'm going to give you over to that. Yeah. All because of the uh, the people, my family, whom you have misled. And how dare they? Because they know. That's the hard part. I mean, they know. Relationally, you are not observing my way and are not lifting up my presence in the Torah. Malachi, messenger, 2-9. You are not observing, paying attention to, closely examining, carefully considering my way. This is Yahweh speaking. And you are not, Nasha, lifting up, respecting, promoting my presence, Pane, in the Torah. Mm. So you want to find Yahweh? Remember, I've, I've probably said this over the course of this program, Kirk, a mm -hmm. hundred times. If you want to find Yahweh in our world, observe the Torah. Right. You'll find him there. You can listen to him there. You can see him there. You will find his presence in the Torah. That was not my opinion. It's a statement of fact. Yahweh stated it here. Relationally, he's saying of humankind as a whole, so the opposite of this would be true. He said, relationally, you are not observing my way. Well, what is Yahweh's way? Pesach, Matzah, Bakodim, Shavuah. Yeah. Teruah, Kippurim, and Sukkah. The seven-step path that leads to camping out with him for all eternity. There isn't a single human institution that observes Yahweh's way. Not one. Where you come to receive information that empowers you to know Yahweh through the Torah, that guides you to the covenant by way of the Torah, that it presents the terms and conditions of the covenant by way of the Torah, that enables you to act upon them, recognizing that the first, second, third, and fourth um, condition of the covenant explain the path that we walk to Yahweh through the Moed Mikre, mm -hmm. so that the sign of the covenant becomes circumcision, right. separation from the institutions of the, the norm. norm. Yeah. The norm. And so here he is saying, you are not observing my way. That's Yahweh's way. And you are not lifting up, accepting, promoting, advocating my presence in the Torah. Yahweh exists in the Torah. That's where you'll find him. If you want to be guided to Yahweh, observe the Torah. You want to know Yahweh, observe the Torah. You want to meet Yahweh, read the Torah. You want to hear Yahweh speak to you, recite the Torah. That's absolutely true. I found that to be absolutely true. They'll talk to you every every day. Yes. Strengthen you, empower you, enrich you. Um, every possible aspect. And I don't think, Kirk, there's anything more important than um, leaving our listeners on that note. Hmm. If you want to meet Yahweh, observe the Torah. If you want to get to know him, recite the Torah. You want to find him, go through a voyage of discovery through the words of the Torah. You'll find him there. And you'll find that he is light, just as his Torah is light. And that as you study those words, he will speak to you. He will reach out his hand to you. He will lift you up. He will flood you with his light, cover you, bathing you in his light. When you incorporate his teaching, his guidance, his Torah, into your heart, you will become his child. And just like light, 
you will become immortal. And just like light, you will become perfect. And just like light, you'll be Yahweh's child. And just like light, you'll be empowered. And just like light, you'll be enriched. So that you can spend eternity camping out with Yahweh in his universe. That's the purpose of the Torah. Right. What a gift. What a gift. The creator of the universe cared enough about us to provide us with this, the most valuable gift in the universe. He gave us a set of instructions whereby we can come to know it. He introduced himself to us in his Torah. He explained how he created the universe and why he created the universe in his Torah. He explained why we exist, and he explained how we can exist eternally. And if we like the God that we meet in his door, he provides us with a plan, the means, a way for us to spend all eternity with him. And not in our present form, as light, enriched, empowered, immortal, perfect. The greatest offer ever made. Indeed. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And indeed, as you lose your religion, your political affinity, your, your affiliations with human institutions, as you jettison those things, you will find that you lost dead weight. You know, it's... Uh, it's uh, to say that, you know, you're all in the mud and you're scummy and filthy and smelly after a hard day of, uh, of work and you uh, jump in the shower and you rinse all of that gunk off. Mm -hmm. Have you lost anything worthwhile? No, of course not. Yeah, that's the shedding of religion and politics and patriotism and human allegiances is that very thing. Oh, it's precious freeing. Yes. You're losing nothing worthwhile. You're being cleansed of the dirt and the scum and the dung that is human institutions. Institutionalized humanity. It's religion. It's politics. It's militarism. It's dung. And the set-apart spirit, the Torah, washes us clean of all of that, making us... Very much like, you know, rather than taking the, the shower of water, although water is used throughout the Torah. Clean, clean, sure. Yeah, because of it's a source of life and it's a cleansing solvent, cleansing nature. But this shower that we're taking is really a shower of light. Mm -hmm. Very clear today. Yeah. yeah. It's light, it's warm. It's light you can see. It's light that you can feel. It's a light that leaves a profound and lasting effect, leaving you perfect and immortal. You're taking literally a bath, a shower in the Torah, um, getting to know Yahweh and becoming ever much more like him. Now, the only thing I would add is you, you have to physically walk the path. You have to participate in this relationship. It's not a cerebral thing. Yes. Totally where you just say, oh, okay, I believe it, then move on. No, no, it's a uh, it's a relationship. Away from those things, and you walk too, you know. Yeah, um, guidance is only good if you follow it. Right. Teaching is only good if you consider it. A relationship is only valuable if you participate in it. Yeah. Uh, so God's inviting you to be part of His family, to engage right. with Him, to participate in eternity with Him, to be elevated so that we are like him, to be lifted up by him, empowered by him, enriched by him, perfected by him, adopted by him. He's offering all of that. But who didn't want to be cut in that deal? Well, obviously 99.999% of humanity. What is wrong with it? Yeah, according to Yahweh, uh, the second instruction he etched in stone, he said that his mercy uh, will be uh, um, afforded to the thousands who closely examine and carefully consider the terms and conditions and the instructions associated with his relationship agreement. So thousands amongst billions is one in a million. That's who's going to be um, accept that deal. 
It was enough to create the universe. It was enough for Yahweh to share the Torah. It will be enough for us to have a marvelous time together for all eternity. We'd encourage you to join us, but to join us, you're going to need to act. You're going to need to carefully consider, closely examining Yahweh's Torah teaching. You need to follow its guidance. You're going to need to act upon what you learn. Thank you, Yahweh, for doing this, too. This has been great. Oh, yeah. It has been. Thank we've, you. Uh, yeah, we've had a wonderful uh, time. We've learned many things. And um, it's been my pleasure. And um, so this is our um, our last minute of our last show. Scott, thank you for um, for being a good friend, for uh, becoming a brother, for producing uh, this program, uh, and for your willingness to continue on in a month's time or so as we record uh, new programs based upon what we continue to learn. But thank you. And Kirk, thank you. Thank Larry. Oh, thanks, uh, JB. Um, thank all of those who uh, called in and were a regular part of, uh, of this program. Thank you so much for listening. Because it's one thing to come to know the truth, and that's exciting. But it's another thing altogether to share it, particularly with those who capitalize on this enlightenment.